chapter of uh, Hebrews. So if you'll turn there, we'll get started. But first, let's have a uh, short, short uh, word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the blessing of this day and for the time we have to study and for the word that has been preserved for us that we can gain thy truth from it in order to direct our steps in this life and that in order that we may gain the life to come. <clears throat> We're thankful for our Lord Jesus Christ who left that uh, perfect abode in heaven to come down and live the life of a man and to suffer ignominiously a death that was not uh, caused by him, caused by the evil of man. But through that death, that death of a sinless life, that he uh, was able to offer himself as a sacrifice for us. For this we are grateful and we pray that we may live our lives in recognition of that sacrifice that he made on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now I think... The last time, I, I don't know if I have it here or not, but uh, they were in that first few uh, uh, verses, there were seven significant statements made there. I had marked it somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where I marked it. But anyway, <clears throat> so uh, in uh, verse 5, uh, he says there that, um, for to which of the angels well let's just do four having become so much better than the angels <clears throat> and that he by, he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they for to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son today I have begotten you and again I will be to him a father and, and he shall be to me a son <clears throat> <clears throat> I look at uh, Psalms, the uh, second chapter, verse 7, that's where uh, this comes from. It says there, I will declare the decree, my Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And the, the agreement uh, or the uh, consensus seemed to be that, that when he says begotten, there, there are a number of kinds of begottens, you know, <clears throat> you know, Lauren just begotten <laughs> a child, but and uh, of course Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, she begot a son, if you want to uh, call it that. But begotten in this sense, because of the significance of it, more related to his resurrection, because if he had never in resurrection and God was the one that raised him from the dead so in that sense uh, God had uh, begotten him so it's generally conceded that uh, it's talking about his resurrection if you look at Acts the 13th chapter verse uh, 32 and 33 <clears throat> and we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers God has fulfilled this for their children in that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So that was the raising up of Jesus from the dead. <clears throat> so he was uh, declared to be the son. Uh, he uh, became head of a new spiritual family, and that's the church. Uh, he was the head of the church. In Ephesians, the first chapter, uh, verses 19 through 23, it says there, and, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that uh, which is to come. So, it, it you know, when he says, I have begotten thee, he's really talking about his uh, resurrection. And, of course, that validated the entire 
that sacrifice that he made if Jesus had never been raised to the dead this would all have been for naught and that demonstrated his power over Satan and it says in uh, uh, the rest of the the latter part of uh, verse 5 said I'll be to him father and he shall be to me a son now you might recall that uh, David had a a great desire to build the temple of God and Samuel first said yeah go ahead and do it and then God said no you're not going to do it Uh, said I'm going to reserve these things for your son to build that was Samuel of course but he said what you can do though of course is get all the materials together and then they'll be ready for uh, Samuel or to for Solomon to build the temple if you look at uh, 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter, verses uh, uh, 14, it reads there, uh, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, he's talking to David, of course, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and I will be his father and he shall be my son if he commits iniquity I, sh- I will chasten him with a rod of men and with the blows of, of uh, men well obviously this is talking about uh, to David of course about Solomon Solomon's going to build the temple but this was also quoted in Hebrews, so it also is talking about Jesus. But what's the the deal here about uh, if he commits iniquity? Because Jesus never committed iniquity, and he was never he was chastened for sure. He was uh, um, oh. Uh, treated very illy, you know, he was uh, beaten and, and so forth and so on. He was certainly uh, suffered punishment, not for anything that he had done, but for the mankind. So he was, in essence, chastened with a rod of men. But this is talking about, uh, I don't need a heater, I need air conditioning. Oh, <laughs> okay. You don't have a Diet Dr. Pepper here too, do you? No, well, no, that's right. We can't have that stuff here. Yeah. Only water. You know, you're going to make somebody a good wife one of these days. <laughs> do you do windows too? <laughs> well, if you get married, you're going to have to. <laughs> that's right. But anyway, where was I? Yeah. Uh, this is what uh, happens sometimes in Scripture where, uh, you know, the, the subject matter is dealing with one event, but uh, prophetically it's also talking about another event, a, a, a double um, reference, if you want to call it that, double fulfillment. <coughs> Talking about two different people in, in different ways. Certainly, Jesus had no iniquity. But uh, we know this is a messianic uh, scripture because it's used in in the Hebrews. He's talking about that. Uh, if we think about it, you know, David desired to build a temple, couldn't do it. Solomon came and built it. And if we uh, look at uh, uh, Christ, he also, he did build a temple, but that's the church. He uh, built a church. It actually was started after he had uh, was crucified and raised and ascended up into heaven. You might also look at uh, 1 Chronicles 17 and 13. It's almost identical to uh, the, the deal in Samuel, except it doesn't say anything about iniquity so 
like I say, it, it obviously re re refers to uh, Jesus, and uh, Jesus did suffer, not because of his own iniquity, but because of the iniquity of others. He did suffer and was chastened with a rod of men, if, if you will. And uh, we go on to verse uh, 6. It says there, uh, but when he again... Uh, well, if you want to look at uh, really a prophetic uh, a prediction of his suffering, you can go to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. You can read that on your own, but it's a very good uh, indication of what Christ was going to have to, to suffer. But in verse 6 it says, but when he again uh, brings the first firstborn into the world he says let all the angels worship him and keep in mind that uh, you know this is being addressed to the Hebrew Christians and they knew the Old Testament very well and uh, angels or angelic beings were held in high regard by the the uh, Hebrews and he, of course that mean Hebrew Christians also but he says here, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, and we have to, I don't think it's such a big deal, but he says again brings the firstborn into the world. <clears throat> what? When did he bring him into the world the first time? Again means a subsequent bringing him into the world. So when is that? When was that? And it can mean that a lot of times when it says again, it just, you know, he was mentioned before, now he's mentioned again. Uh, Jesus was certainly uh, brought into the world through the, the birth to Mary. That could be one bringing in the world, but also it could be when he was uh, raised from the dead, that was another bringing into the world. And likely that is what is being talked about here because at that point in time there was every reason for the angels to worship him because he was raised from the dead now the other times that might be uh, referred to as uh, a coming of Jesus if you will like when the destruction of Jerusalem AD 70 uh, predicted in you know, Matthew 24 that was a sort of a coming of Jesus not certainly it was not the second coming <laughs> that, you know where you know, everything is brought to an end and, and everyone is either carried away to paradise or some other place <laughs> but uh, but probably here refers to his uh, resurrection from the dead if you I want to maintain another view that consistent and with the uh, textual uh, meaning of the, the verse, fine. But then, because he was raised from the dead, again it says, let all the angels of God worship him. And that's uh, taken from uh, uh, Psalms, the 97th chapter, verse 7, and we talked about this before and had some questions on it. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols, and worship him, all you gods. Now it was uh, mentioned before that gods here in the Old Testament is from the word Elohim, which is properly translated. Well, there's different ways to translate it, but generally it's translated uh, gods in the uh, Old Testament. But Hebrews did not quote the Hebrew Old Testament. The Old Testament in Hebrew, it did not quote that. It quoted the Septuagint. 
and the translators of the Septuagint, they, they, they translated between the, and during the uh, intertestamentary period, of course. But they translated this uh, Elohim, when they translated in Greek, they translated it as angelos, angels. And so that would uh, seem to indicate that uh, Elohim is certainly a, a being on a higher plane than man. That, that's no doubt about that. But in, in accordance with the text, it, it could mean something other than uh, Jehovah or God the Father, Son, or, or what have you. It could mean something other than that. And, and the translators of the Septuagint, of course, much closer uh, to that time than we are now, and they seem to think it was should be translated uh, angelos, and it does fit the context that that uh, uh, let all the angels of God worship Him. Because he wouldn't, you know, when you talk about gods, usually uh, Elohim is translated God, but it, it's a plural word. It is a plural word. And for all the gods, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, be worshiping God, Jesus, that just doesn't fit the context. But it does mean that there's some spiritual being greater than man that uh, would be worshiping Jesus. So. I think that's the reason that they translated it uh, angel. Yes, sir. Could be. And in that regard, uh, is the way that you, which removes it completely from here. From, from what? Old, from what? Moves it from what? Removes it from the earth. Oh, the earth. And the whole thing, when it comes to the begotten of God, Christ, is not just the resurrection, it's the resurrection, the ascension, and the coronation. Peter would say in Acts chapter 2, he now is at the right hand of God, ruling. He yep. could not be proclaimed on earth that he was sitting and ruling with Peter and James to be there. You can't just look at the resurrection alone. You have to look at the resurrection, the ascension, and the coronation seated at the right hand of God. Daniel foresaw that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can't look at Christ just on the basis of his existence when he came to this world. You can't look at it just on the basis of his patient. You can't look at it just on the basis of his death and burial. You have to add resurrection, ascension, and coronation. Then he's the only begotten of the Father. After we receive the kingdom, he's now in his place and will not leave it till the end of this whole age. When he gives up the kingdom of God and all things go back to us. Okay. Anybody get that? Okay. <clears throat> Did I read uh, Romans 1, verse 4? I think it kind of just speaks to that. It, it, he was. Uh, Again, it has to do with uh, firstborn in the world. He, he's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In verse 7 it says, And the angels, of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the man of son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. 
the scepter of righteousness and is the scepter of your kingdom. <clears throat> Let's see. When it talks about uh, talking about the angels, you know, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, uh, that indicates that they're they are of uh, some importance. They're not just man; they're spirit beings. Uh, they have power, but even so, even so. To the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter, and a scepter is just a, um, if you, I guess, probably if you look at the coronation of the Queen of England, she carries some sort of stick or something, a scepter. They give, that indicates the uh, authority and power that, that, uh, regal person that uh, regent uh, holds. So the, his scepter is righteousness, and it's also the scepter, the, the standard, if you will, of the kingdom. And his throne, the throne is occupied by a king. It's going to be a forever and uh, ever. And it's interesting to note to the Son, he's speaking to the Son, but he calls the Son, O oh God. And it again, it gets back to the idea that, that uh, there is a uh, divine essence, God, three persons, God the Father, God the Son. So Jesus is properly called God as well. And... Uh, so oh, anyway, I'm trying to find my place here. In verse nine, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, you're anointed. You're Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of, of gladness more than your companions. And this word companions, that's new, of course, New King James, but the uh, uh, King James and the ASV have fellows. So the question is, who are the companions and who are the, the fellows? You have to think about who uh, Jesus is. He was called uh, the, uh, he's a king, he's a high priest, he was a prophet, he was also called an apostle. So those four things that he, he's called, and he uh, has all those things as his attributes, but there are other kings, apostles, prophets, and what have you. So these would be his companions or fellows, those of like nature, except he exceeds them all. And because he is he loved righteousness, he always lived a righteous life and he never did anything that was uh, of lawlessness, always obeyed the law, which none of the others ever did, even though they, some of them had some of the titles. He had them all. So he was anointed above and beyond all of these other people of, of like titles. <clears throat> In verses 10 through 12, 
it says there uh, and you Lord in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands and they will perish but you remain and they all will they will all grow old like a garment like a cloak you will fold them up and they will be changed but you are the same and your years will not fail now I will uh, caution you if you're looking at uh, Robert Milligan's commentary on the book of Hebrews he will he may confuse you what he uh, has to say about this particular verse but he ascribes to the uh, uh, gap theory of evolution and so he'll comment on that saying that this is really not the end of the world destruction but it's a uh, uh, it's going to be reconstituted and if you want a good analysis of the gap theory and why such a uh, assertion is in error you can go to the 2009 lecture book put out here and I had a chapter there on on a theistic evolution and I dealt quite extensively with the gap uh, theory of evolution because it was so prevalent uh, in the church it I don't know what it is nowadays. I don't know what people do at all nowadays, but back in the time when the, the uh, uh, Restoration Movement was going on, it was a very prevalent view. And, and Milligan died in 1875, and he wrote that commentary shortly before he, he died. So it was, and that was the time when, of course, Darwin, Darwin's book was uh, getting some traction and you know Thomas Huxley was uh, promoting it very heavily, and so there are a lot of uh, very uh, renowned uh, scholars in the church who were they were somehow they were trying to figure out how this all fit together. So they came up with the uh, gap theory. But I'm just saying that if you're using that commentary, you will find that in his commentary. So just a word of caution there. This particular uh, verse comes from uh, Psalms, Psalms 102nd, uh, 102nd Psalm. It says there of old, 25th chapter, in, at, at 102nd Psalm, 25th through 27th verse. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens will work your hands, and they will perish but you will endure yes they all will grow old like a garment like a cloak you will change them and they will be changed but you're the same and your years have no end so uh, we know that uh, uh, deity God is eternal uh, man is well man's soul is eternal but not in the same sense as God is eternal because man's soul has a beginning. God does not. So when men, God breathed into man the, the soul. And from that point on, it's, it lives forever. One place or the other. It's going to be it remain somewhere. So it, in that sense, it, it, it remains forever. But it's not eternal like God is eternal. <clears throat> In Hebrews, the uh, <clears throat> 13th, uh, first chapter, verses 13. Uh, <clears throat> of course, we know from 1 John <clears throat> and uh, John, the first part of the gospel according to John and first part of 1 John, that uh, Jesus is the one that uh, was instrumental in the uh, formation of the world and is by his design did 
Did God the Father and God the uh, Holy Spirit? They were there too. So, and did they have something to do with it? Some places in the New Testament it kind of indicates that uh, they did, but it's very specific that Jesus did. So it was, uh, I would say that it was his design as to what uh, actually uh, came about. In verses uh, 13 through 14, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Well, again, he's, uh, he's speaking to the Hebrew Christians. And which of the angels did he ever say? With very powerful beings, of course, spiritual beings. But to which one of those did he ever say, sit at my right hand? Sitting at the right hand of uh, God the Father, that, that's a place of prestige and power. That's something the angels never had. And the Hebrew Christians, of course, uh, held the angels in high regard. So this would say that you should hold Jesus Christ himself in higher regard than the angels. Because it never was said to the angels, you know, sit at my right hand till I make your uh, enemies your footstool. This comes from the 110th Psalm, verse 1. And said, the Lord said, my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. When we get over to the second chapter, it says there, therefore, we must give the most more earnest heed. Therefore means based on what's already been talked about. We must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And keep in mind that the Hebrew Christians were uh, gradually drifting away. This drifting away has the idea of, let's say, um, anybody ever put a, a leaf out in a pond, you know, that's very still? It eventually just kind of slowly drifts away. These Christians were not just running pell-mell away from the uh, the church, but they were slowly drifting away, just gradually getting further and further away from the truth. He says, uh, For the word spoken through angels prove steadfast, and it did, and we'll look at that in a moment. If a word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and uh, the angels were at least somewhat instrumental in 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 uh, the Old Testament in writing the Old Testament or uh, revealing the Old Testament, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. These Hebrew Christians knew the Old Testament. And they knew that what the prophets had said, had promised, that there was a um, reward for obedience and a punishment for disobedience. They knew that. They knew that every transgression and disobedience received a reward. God has never left sin, let sin go unpunished. Now, when comes to Jesus Christ he offered a sacrifice that that the uh, uh, the punishment could uh, be forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ it was not ignored sin was not ignored it was still dealt with but with Jesus Christ when one confesses their sins to him, you know, after rending obedience, of course, then uh, they would be washed in the blood of Christ. It still does not go 
uh, unpunished or it, it, it is always dealt with. It may be through forgiveness or prolonged confession, but it is, it is always dealt with. And it says a just reward. God is never ignores his uh, uh, sense of justice. And that's why Jesus, as God, had to come to the earth, live the life, uh, a sinless life, that qualified him to shed his blood that he could go through the veil to the Holy of Holies. And that thereby we could uh, have forgiveness of our sins. <clears throat> but it says in verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great uh, salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him and that's the apostles and what have you God, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and that's the purpose of signs and wonders to confirm the word uh, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will he, he meted out the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit as he deemed fit. <clears throat> and the Hebrews, of course, uh, they trusted fully in the, the prophets. And if they could do that, why couldn't they fully trust in the Son? Why would they want to go away from that? And they knew that the words spoken by the angels were, uh, whatever they said, was steadfast. It was a sure thing. Well, you have Jesus the superior to the angels. Why would you want to abandon him because of what you know he said? If we look at uh, Galatians, the um, not Galatians, uh, I lost it. Three, verse nineteen. Look at Galatians three, verse nineteen. And this is the purpose of the law. He said, what was the purpose uh, then does the law serve? It was because, added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. And of course, the original mediator, if you uh, call it that, of the old law was uh, Moses himself. He's the one that, uh, and that's why they call it the law of Moses. <clears throat> and so this first part, and we probably won't get into the second part, but the, this first part was uh, stressing the, the superiority of Christ over the angels. And keep in mind that the uh, Hebrew Christians regarded the angels very highly. <clears throat> Man was, of course, not created created in the image of God, but not the uh, physical image of God, because God doesn't have a physical uh, image at all. So we we were given a spiritual image of God. And, of course, uh, God breathing to us the breath of life. And man became a, a living soul. And as I said, that soul, soul never dies. It will exist somewhere. It may not be in heaven, but it will exist somewhere. But when... Uh, I think somebody brought this up recently. But when uh, uh, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, which was a 
perfect place. Initially, it was there was no sin in the Garden of Eden. But the, the uh, serpent told Eve that, in essence, that if she ate of the fruit of the tree of uh, knowledge, good and evil, that she'd become like God. And God had uh, supremacy over the uh, creation of the, the garden. But he lost that supremacy. In a sense, you know, we still have supremacy over the physical world. But not entirely. There are a lot of things going that we can't control anymore. There are a lot of uh, bad things that happen, uh, like COVID-19, <laughs> things like that. A lot of bad things that happen that we can't uh, control any longer. But anyway, all the authority of that exists now is in the uh, hand of the Son. He has all authority in heaven and earth. And someday, though, he'll return this uh, scepter of righteousness to, to heaven. If we read in First uh, Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 20 to 28, it says there that now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, uppercase man, also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, he was risen from the dead to die no more. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God and the Father, puts an end to all rule and authority and power. And if you go over to, uh, I think it's Second Peter, it talks about the, the, uh, how all things be burned up, which is directly contradictory to the uh, gap theory. But anyway, he puts all, an end to all rule and authority and power or he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son of himself will also be subject to him and put all things under him that God may be all in all. So we'll take up with the fifth verse of chapter 2 next week.